he uh, found this in manuscript form in India, in the archives, and uh, republished it, edited it, and republished it. You know, so <coughs> that has survived. You know, from that time. Anyway, um, Ibn Omar, eight of his students wrote down hadith from him. Anas ibn Malik, 16 of his students had hadith in written form from him. Aisha bint Abi Bakr, three of her students had hadith in written form. Ibn Abbas, nine of his students recorded hadith. Jabir ibn Abdullah, 14 of his students recorded hadith. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, none of his students recorded hadith. Ibn Mas Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, none of his students recorded hadith. But Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, seven of his students had hadith in written form. Uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab wrote many hadith in official letters. He didn't so much have students as he was the leader of the Muslim state. So what was conveyed from him which people received was the official letters, etc., which he uh, wrote. Ali ibn Abi Talib, eight of his students recorded hadiths in writing. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, some of his students were in the possession uh, of, uh, some of his hadiths, sorry, were in possession of Abdullah ibn Abbas, in the written form, he had studied under Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And al-Barra ibn Azib, he was also known to dictate his narrations to his students. So we do have some companions who didn't have students who wrote down, not that they didn't have any students, they did narrate a number of hadith, but they were not in favor of writing of hadith. You know? So there were some companions who weren't. But the vast majority, out of these twelve, really only two of them, two out of the twelve, discouraged or didn't want anyone to write hadith from them. There, the reason for that was they either uh, themselves <clears throat> because one of them who didn't allow it, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he was the one who narrated the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, don't write down anything from me besides the Qur'an. Right? So he took that in the literal form, right? And he stuck by it. Right? Uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, his reason exactly was just that he preferred the students to uh, to, to learn from him through memorization, he favored the, the method of memorization and that uh, he felt that uh, writing, you know, was uh, too easy, it just made the gaining of knowledge too simple, so he preferred his students to memorize. But the vast majority of the companions that said they in fact uh, had students who, mem who wrote down hadith as well as memorized, and uh, these students in turn they then conveyed the information in the written form uh, to the following generation. The generation after them, this is the fourth level, this is known as the Tabi'ut Tabi'in. Tabi'ut Tabi'in, Tabi' meaning follower or, su of, or successor. Tabi'in, that is the plural form of Tabi'. So it means the successors of the successors or the followers of the successors, however you want to translate it in English. And uh, this represents the final stage in the narration of hadith, where individuals were narrating uh, from their own books, they had collections, or from the Sahaba. We have the Sahaba, we have their students, and we have the students of the students of the Sahaba. The students of the students, this represented the last link in the chain of transmission, uh, from that point onward, you found now hadiths were collected into major collections and handed down more in the written form than in oral narrations. From this period, we have the, the uh, oldest work to have survived and been handed down to us, and that is al muwatta al muwatta of Imam Malik, who was the Imam of Medina. And his grandfather was a Sahabi. Right? His grandfather was himself a companion of the Prophet Muhammad right? So, as you can imagine, 
the distance between the Prophet ﷺ and what he narrated and those who made the final collections was not that far, though they refer to it as the second century. In fact, the Sahaba existed, a number of them existed almost to the end of the first century. And the second century, uh, I mean, they had students, the Tabi'een, they were in the latter half of the first century, and they lived between the first and the second. So, they're really the, the, the gap of time between Prophet Muhammad and the complete recording of his hadith, in fact, are, was very short. And we can, and has been stated, that the vast majority of the hadith were written down in the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad himself. They were handed in the time of the Sahaba to their students, and, the, and they continued to be in writing, but it just wasn't compiled into individual text. It was really the generation of the Tabi'u Tabi'in and the one which came after them which they commonly call the, the generation of the Sahih or the era of the Sahih. This is the third century. This is when you found the books of Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abi Dawood and these books, you know, uh, came up. Right? Uh, this is where the major uh, writing took place and the number of hadith narrations by this time were quite a lot. Imam Bukhari, for example, himself, his uh, collection of hadith, you know, contained uh, 7,275 hadith. And this is with repetition. Actually, if you cut down those, uh, because what he would do is like, he would take a narration, he would narrate a portion of it in one chapter, and another portion of it in another chapter some with some overlapping right because one portion was relevant to one issue because he organized it according to headings uh, some of it relating to Islamic law some of it relating to um, uh, etiquettes etc so his collection of some 7275 narrations was extracted from over 600,000 channels of narration See, the number of narrations had become quite huge. Not that the 7,000 was in fact the essence of those 600,000. There were some he chose and some he didn't. So his book, though he calls it the Sahih, the, his attempt was not to gather all of the Sahih, but just a portion of it. And, he, and that's what he, he did in his collection. <coughs> now, if we look at this process from the point of view of the writing itself as opposed to the point of view of the uh, generations, the first uh, level, first stage, which was within the first century, beginning after the Hijra, this is referred to as the stage of the Sahifa. The Sahifa. Sahifa meaning literally page. Right? And their writings tended to be on pages of material. They were either goatskin or they were, you know, the type of, of material that were available for writing the Quran. You know? Either were, they were boughs of palm trees or um, shoulder blades of camels, etc., etc. You know? The most popular one was, of course, parchment because that could be folded up and carried more easily. You know, if you have a bunch of shoulder blades, it gets kind of heavy, you know? <laughs> Um, the second level or period or stage of writing was called the stage of the Musannaf, you know, which literally means a classified or organized work. This covers the middle of the uh, second century of the Hijra, after the Hijra. And this is, uh, this uh, includes the work of Imam Malik and Muatta is included in that stage of writing, <coughs> the Musannaf. What you find in terms of Musannaf is that it may contain a variety of material. It may not just contain hadith, it may also contain the rulings of the Sahaba. There was, it's kind of like a mixture. It wasn't really a hadith book as we come to know it later on. You know, it contained rulings of the, uh, rulings of the Sahaba themselves, or sometimes rulings of the Tabi'een, their students, were included in what were classified as the Musannaf. <coughs> 
you know, in the Mot of Malik, you'll find all of that. Uh, the stage after that uh, was known, and, and this was towards the end of the second century, this was known as the, sta the stage of the Musnad, and of the hadith which we would call Musnad or collections, is the well-known Musnad of Ahmed. Musnad Ahmed which contains some 40,000 hadiths, right, with some repetition. With removing the repetition may drop down to about 25 to 30,000. But the, the Musnads were organized according to uh, alphabetical collections of the na according to the names of the Sahaba. They would list the Sahaba and alphabetically and then mention all of the hadith which this Sahabi narrated. So there were compilations based around the Sahaba themselves, their names, as opposed to uh, basing them on topics, various topics. And the fourth stage of writing, <coughs> which is considered the most important stage, is that of the, the Sahih, right? the Sahih of Bukhari. This began in the first part of half of the third century and overlaps uh, to some degree the period of the Musnad. You know? But this is the period now where the issues of authentication became uh, the, you know, great. So the text of co compilations came to be referred to as Sahih, you know, and the Sunan. These are the four Sunan, well-known Sunan. Uh, this, these were compiled in this period. Now, what we're saying here, if we look back at the process of compilation of Hadith, is that the Hadith in general were not narrated merely orally. This is the main misconception which needs to be removed. That in fact, the vast majority of the hadith were narrated in writing. The vast majority, if not all. Very, very important. Because it is commonly quoted that writing of hadith didn't take place until the second century idea being some 200 years after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu But, and though there are references of this nature, that the major writing took place in the second century, but you have to understand that when they're talking about the second century, they're not talking about 200 years really after the time the Prophet Sallallahu died. The second, the first century began with the Hijra. It included the last 10 years of the Prophet Sallallahu life and uh, included the lives of much of these companions. Many of them lived almost to the end of that first century. And then they're the ones who actually heard the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. So when you say that the major writing took place in the second century, that is in the lifetimes of the students of the companions who heard and saw and related. So we're not talking about a huge gap of time at all. And as I mentioned, the vast majority of those companions who narrated, narrated, especially those who narrated large amounts, you know, more than 20 hadith, the vast majority of them wrote down their hadith. They wrote them down themselves, and they narrated it to students who also wrote down the hadith. So the process of writing began in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was continued in the time, in the era of his companions, which overlapped with his own time, and into the era of the, the students of the companions, which overlapped into the era of the companions themselves, and then also after their time, after they passed away. And it was in that second century, quote unquote second century, that the major compilation took place. That is, gathering of it all. Not the writing. The writing we said took place from the time of Prophet Muhammad But the actual compilation in now into the major works like that of Al-Muwatta and following it Al-Musnad, you know, Musnad Ahmed and the other Musnad, Masanid is the plural of Musnad. And in the era which followed them we find the uh, major uh, compilation into the well-known books that we know today. But the <coughs> initial compilation it took place really in the time 
of major compilation took place in the time of the students of the companions. And it was Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, right, who is known as the fifth righteous caliph, sometimes he's referred to as the fifth righteous caliph. He is the one who gave the instructions for the hadith to be recorded, I mean, and, and collected, compiled. Right? And uh, uh, Az Zuhri is known as the biggest figure of that era who uh, was leading the leading figure in the process of compilation. And we will be looking at that this in our future sessions in more detail when we look at the actual process of transmission. How did the Sahaba pass it on? What was their methodology? What did they use? We said there was writing, but you know, what, what does this mean in terms of did they hand their books over or did they, you know, read these books or did they ask people to read the books or whatever? We'll be looking at the methodology uh, of transmission. This will be in our session tomorrow. <clears throat> as well as, uh, you know, continuing with the, the historical process of the compilation. Okay, inshallah, uh, we'll stop here if you have any questions that you'd like to raise concerning the uh, either the significance of hadith which is what we covered in our first section or the actual process of compilation of hadith themselves okay our brother's question you know, how, did, how do we harmonize or rationalize the two instructions of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to the writing of hadith? On one hand, the instructed companions, Abu Sa'id and Khudri is the one who narrated the hadith, it's found in Sahih Muslim. He uh, instructed that nothing besides the Quran should be written. And yet, on the other hand, we have Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, coming to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ telling him that whatever I say is truth, so write it. How do we uh, harmonize these two statements? As we said that, and as the leading scholars generally concluded, that the statements of the Prophet ﷺ must be looked at in the context of his general practice. His general practice was to have people write down statements of his. We know from the letters, we know from other cases, other hadiths I mentioned where people asked the Prophet write this down for me and they said, okay, write for Abu Shah and so on and so on. You know, we have so many instances of writing and the Sahaba saying themselves, we used to write in the time of Prophet Muhammad, so many cases, that it meant then that this instruction wasn't to be taken on face value, but it had to be looked at within a context. And that context was the writing of the Qur'an. That those people who were directly involved in the writing of the Qur'an, they were instructed by the Prophet ﷺ, perhaps initially, and then later that instruction was left. Or it was a general instruction that in writing the Qur'an, one should not write hadiths along with it. And this was to avoid hadiths being mixed up with Quranic texts. Interpolations, which comes to be known as interpolation. So that's how the majority of scholars took it. In fact, Imam Bukhari and a number of other scholars of his time, they took the position that this hadith, right, which ended up being transmitted as a statement of Prophet Muhammad was actually a statement of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri himself, which later, as it was handed down, uh, and he didn't have anybody write, it got mistakenly uh, quoted as a statement from Prophet Muhammad himself. This is the position held by Imam Bukhari. Of course, this is, I mean, it's arguable. Was it this the case or was it not the case? I mean, the fact that there were so many other narrations where he gave instructions to write, this does tend to point to the fact that this may be, this may in fact be the case. But if those who have narrated it, handed it down, were among the highly uh, respected narrators of hadith, 
you know, then we have to take it on face value that in fact it was a statement about Muhammad Your question? Uh, Abu you mentioned graves and mosques and you should have said very different prophets where they die. And then some of the Romania uh, Empire expanded the mosque to include it. Can you explain that? Just from what you understand this is going on there. Okay, brother, just asking for further clarification on how the Prophet's grave became included in the masjid, in his masjid. As I mentioned, uh, the wives, the homes of the wives of the Prophet were on the left side of the masjid. They were on the left side of the masjid. They each wife had a one room or one and a half room apartment and the door opened right onto the masjid. So he would leave his the home of his wives and walk straight into the masjid. Okay. And uh, after his death, when he was buried in Aisha's home, in the time of Omar radiallahu anhu, he did expand the masjid, but he expanded it to the other side. To the, to the right side as opposed to the left side. And there were other homes, people's homes were very close, right up next to the masjid. In fact, you still have, if you go to Masjid in Nabawi, certain doors are called Bab Omar. Huh? Why? Because that was where Omar's home used to be. He used to leave his home and go to the masjid also. They had built their homes right next to the masjid. Okay? So that's why you still have the names after some of the companions. Anyway, those homes were, dis were torn down and the masjid was expanded to the right. It was expanded eventually towards the Qibla, increased. And that's why you find two mihrabs in the masjid. If you look at Masjid Nabawi, you'll have a, a mihrab where they have the green rugs, which they call the rawda. There's a mihrab, that concave niche where Imam may stand and pray. And then you have another one farther forward, right? Where people line up where the Imam actually now stands and prays. Right? That's because of the expansion which took place. And people have maintained the, um, the, the location of the original uh, mihrab of the Prophet Muhammad Of course, in the Prophet Muhammad Masjid, there was no mihrab. Right? This was added later. Uh, and they maintained that location because of the statement of the Prophet Muhammad in which he said uh, what is between my home and uh, the member is from the uh, gardens of paradise right and uh, that's why they call it Rauda, Rauda meaning a garden so during the lifetime of the Sahaba, no expansion took place on the left. But after the time of Muawiyah, actually well, it was not even the time of Muawiyah, who was the first of the Umayyad dynasty, but after his time, in the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he instructed the governor of Medina to make the expansion on the left side also. And uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, who was one of the leading tabi'in or successor students of the Sahaba at the time. He was there in Medina and he instructed them not to do this. Because they were now creating a situation which Prophet Sallallahu had prohibited. But they went ahead and did it anyway. And this is why during the Umayyad period, you know, after the time of Muawiyah and the, the rulers after that, many of the Muslim scholars left the centers where the rulers were because of the fact that they were incorporating practices etc which were un-Islamic you know and they didn't want to be in a position of having you know a compromising position of uh, having to be quiet when they were doing some of these things uh, so as not to bring on themselves uh, the wrath of the <coughs> rulers <coughs> so that expansion took place as I said uh, during the time of Abu Malik and Marwan and they did place, even when they did it, they still placed around it a kind of diamond shaped wall, you know, three sides. And they put it, you know, 
in such a way that people, if they wanted to try to face the wall directly, you know, uh, they would be away from the Qibla, so that people wouldn't line up and um, appear to be praying towards the Qibla, but they were in fact praying towards the grave. They deliberately did this. Uh, later on, you know, other, in the time of the Ottoman Turks, and that they put around it a cage, which is what we see now, a brass cage, uh, draped, uh, green cloth was put over the house of Aisha, and uh, the brass cage was put around it, you know, sealed, and um, that's now it's back in a format which a person could stand behind it and appear to be praying in the direction of Qibla when they're actually in fact praying to the grave. <coughs> okay, brother's question, uh, it's not permissible, but it's still there today. In fact, in many parts of the Muslim world where they end up burying, you know, righteous people or people they consider to be righteous saints, whatever, in the masjids, uh, okay, okay, basically, in, in, in Pakistan, I think I could hardly find a master that didn't have a grave in there someplace. You know? Most of the masters that visited Pakistan had a grave there, right? Maybe some of them were, you know, in the, in the Tibla area. Some of them were in the courtyard outside of the masjid, you know, which was still a part of the masjid because people prayed in the courtyard. But, um, you know, people, when, when these issues are raised, they say, but Medina, <laughs> you know, if it was good enough for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi it's good enough for us, right? You know, sort of attitude, but of course this is based on ignorance, they didn't know how the Prophet grave got in there. <clears throat> but the question is, why wasn't it removed? It remains there. Well, this has to do with politics. Politics. Strictly politics. It has nothing to do with the deed. It has strictly to do with politics. Because even the green dome, which we traditionally see, which is placed right over his grave, Actually, the green dome is, is a structure built over his grave that, according to Islamic law, should be destroyed and removed. Yeah. But it has now become the symbol of the Masjid of Medina, unfortunately. But the point is that, okay, uh, when the uh, followers of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and uh, the family of Saud uh, took over Arabia, took over Mecca and Medina, they did begin a process of purification. All of the all of the trees, there were trees and things which people had be, be, believed were places of barakah. People were going there to the trees and making special du'as there and prayers there and all these trees which the was supposed to be for Bayatul uh, Ridwan, you know, which actually Omar had already cut down so it didn't exist. But people had invented another tree and said this was the one, you know, and the house of uh, of uh, Prophet Sallallahu parents in Mecca, all these kind of structures were there, and they went and they destroyed all of these things, right? They went into the uh, graveyards of Medina and Mecca, which by that time looked like cities, because people had built so many structures over it, you know, domes and, and virtual little minarets, mini minarets and things like this inside there. They look like, literally, uh, Towns, if you see pictures of the graveyards from that period, they went in, they leveled everything. They leveled all the graves, you know, even with the ground. When they did that, like the Taliban, right? the Taliban went and took out the Buddhas, you know, the whole world screamed. You know, these ignorant Taliban, you know, look what they're doing, it's not from Islam. It's from Similarly, when they leveled all these graves, you know, the Muslim world, which were used to building structures over their graves, and uh, when they, especially those which were built over the grave of Fatma and all these others there, they said, this was a big, big crime. They said, look at these Wahhabis, you know. The, and of course, Wahhabi then became like an evil apostate who was trying to destroy Islam. That's what the name Wahhabi came to mean. But in fact, it was people who were, uh, they referred to them as the Puritans. They, they wanted to go back to the pure Islam. They were fundamentalists. They wanted to practice Islam as it was taught by Prophet Muhammad Sallam, but not, and not as it had become culturally defaced and distorted you know, over the many generations. So after they did that and the Muslim world screamed, then for them to go and remove the grave from the masjid and tear down the green dome, <laughs> they were, politically they felt it wasn't was wise to do it at this point in time. Because you know what would happen, what was the consequence? And the Muslim world would send armies in there, you know, to go and 
just remove them, right? So they didn't do it. And nobody has had the nerve to do it since then. And of course, it has to come from the leadership. Right? <laughs> it has to come from the leadership. I mean, I mean, you as an individual can't go there and decide you're going to start tear down the walls of the masjid, right? I mean, the Muslims themselves, you know. <laughs> but you know, the point is that um, the best way for it to be dealt with, you know, is The best way for it to be dealt with, you know, is to be dealt with through the leadership. Yes. You know, this is the best way. Because, you know, if it were done, you know, as a guerrilla action, <laughs> as you are suggesting, <laughs> then what would happen is that those in authority would just go and build it back. You know? They would build it back because the same reason why it's there it's the same reason why they did it back. So you just be, you know, defeating your purpose, really. So the, the best thing is just to leave it until such time as we have the kind of leadership that is uh, firmly grounded in the Quran and the Sunnah as understood by the Sahaba to correct it or, you know, to the time of the Mahdi. If that's when it has to be done, well then, you leave it till then. Uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Any other question? Any questions from the sisters? They can uh, just relate to the same thing. Since we are all going through the problem, also mostly the sisters we have we have a Muslim Christian. Okay, brother's question. You know, if we are instructed not to pray uh, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallam or through him, then what of these uh, prayer maps that we have with pictures of the masjid on it? Right? Masjid and Nabu. Yeah, in many cases. Well, it's not good. It's really better that if we're going to use a prayer map, it should be plain, really. Prophet <coughs> discouraged anything which would distract us, would catch our attention, distract us in the prayer. So it is preferable that the prayer mat be plain, you know. And in fact, by putting these pictures, the Kaaba or Masjid Nabawi, we are misinforming others about who we worship. Because uh, those people who think that in fact we may be worshipping the Kaaba or the mosque in Medina, and this is confirmed, here we are. We have these rugs with the Kaaba and the mosque, right? Just like they will uh, worship their idols, either in a physical form, the actual idol they keep at home, or they have a picture. You know, they have a picture of Ganesh, and they do their little worship around Ganesh picture. You know, it is just as good as, not quite as good, but almost as good as doing it with the idol itself. Right? So, we actually uh, contribute to the misunderstanding of people about Islam, by producing these uh, colorful prayer mats with pictures of the uh, Master in Nabawi and the Kaaba on them. And they're really not in keeping with Islamic tradition. Well, there's question concerning... Uh, well, there's question concerning uh, repeated narrations of hadith. For example, like in Sahih al-Bukhari. He asked whether these are discarded. No. What, it, what we're dealing with here is that a hadith may address more than one issue. A hadith may have in it statements 
more than one issue. Prophet Sallam oftentimes said things, you know, people were asked about one thing and he would answer about more than one. You know, he would give further, you know, depth, depth to the, in the answer to the question that was directed to him. So, what happened then is that a repeated hadith may be, may be put under one, more than one heading. Maybe it's put under two, three, four different headings because there are different aspects of it that are relevant to uh, the different uh, subjects. For example, the hadith concerning Dajjal. Okay? Hadith concerning Dajjal or the Antichrist is generally put in the, uh, under the heading of signs of the last day, right? the final hour, things connected to the last day. But in the same time, uh, <coughs> Prophet ﷺ had said that the, the, the Dajjal would rule for 40 days. The first day would be equivalent to one year. So the companions asked, right, will five prayers suffice for that one day that's like a year? People who live in areas where you have six months of sunlight, it's one day, six months long. So they asked, will five prayers suffice then? He said, no. You have to estimate it. Estimate for it. So, that hadith, though initially it comes under the heading of uh, signs of the last day, it has implications in terms of uh, prayers, prayer timings and estimation of prayers in circumstances where it is necessary to make some estimation. So it can be put under two different headings. On what? What do you mean? On what basis were they recorded? Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, basis under which uh, hadiths were, were recorded and uh, identified, classified, etc., this is coming. Uh, this is part of the course. Uh, so one section will be on hadith classification. You know, on, on what basis do we say a hadith is sahih? Do we say that it is which is authentic, highly authentic? And do we say it is da'if, it is What is the basis for it? We touched the foundations of it in our second level of our course, but now we'll be looking at it in more depth. <laughs> Okay, again, you're jumping the gun. A question concerning profiles or biographies of the hadith narrators. Where did this come? Where is it found? They're found in books known as Kutub ar-Rijal, or the biographical works. There were works which have been compiled on the various narrators. And in fact, the information about these various narrators was handed down along with the narration of the hadiths. Okay, the total number of Sahaba uh, are different estimates have been put, you know. The high estimate is something like a hundred thousand. Others are less than that, the you know, 60s, 40s, 80s, thousands. They, they met him. Yeah, yeah, all that is included as a sahabi. They just met him one time, accepted Islam on his hand and left. 
vast majority of hadiths, question number the vast majority of hadiths were narrated in written form. Written form. They're written down. They're written down. A channel of narration represents a chain of narrators carrying oh, a particular statement of the Prophet It may be from a single Sahabi, but each one of his students and the student's students, each one of them represents or each grouping represents a channel of narration of that particular statement of that Sahabi. I should mention that <coughs> besides the fact that you know it was in that third generation, the Tabi or Tabi'in, that the major writing took place, that those three generations had a special place in the sight of, of the Ummah from the point of view the Prophet ﷺ had said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of people are my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. So special status was also given to the uh, hadith, uh, the narration of hadith in those first three generations. And um, of course, when Prophet said that, uh, I mean, Allah knows he didn't uh, mean specifically that they would be the ones that would, would do the major recording of the hadith, but that's what it turned out to be. I mean, this is obviously his statement of them being the best of generation is based on a revelation from Allah for him to make that claim without the revelation from Allah. And in fact, they did play a major role in the protection of Islam. And that those first three generations are generally referred to by the term Salaf. Salaf meaning pious predecessors. And so you may hear the term Salafi, you know, person says, I'm a Salafi, meaning I follow the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood by those first three generations. Because they best understood Islam. Okay, brother is asking why if the total number of Sahaba may have been anywhere between 50,000 and 100,000, why only 1,060 of them narrated hadith? Well, <coughs> there is a well-known statement of Prophet Muhammad Whoever tells a lie about me deliberately should take his seat or sitting place in the hellfire. This hadith was narrated by many, many, many companions. Well known. Prophet repeated this on a number of occasions. He warned against fabrication. Actually, in the narration of that same hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri where his brother said don't write anything uh, other than the Quran he, in the end of that narration he says uh, and whoever lies about me will find a seeking place in the Alpha. it's mentioned actually even in that narration so the companions were very wary about narrating anything which may be uh, doubtful, you know, maybe they forgot or whatever. So only those who were absolutely sure that what they were conveying was in fact what the Prophet Sallallahu said, he did or he approved. They're absolutely sure. Only those who were absolutely sure narrated. So that shows really the care and concern that the companions had to avoid, you know, false information being conveyed about or from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.